Hello, colleagues. Now we begin our student part of our conference, Correlation Optics. And uh, today we have uh, three lectures uh, from uh, as a part of our conference. And the first uh, will be Mark Dennis from United Kingdom. Please, Mark. Okay, thank you very much. Can you hear me? And can you see my screen? Yes, yes, yes. Everybody, okay, good. Thank you very much. So, hello everybody. I'm going to tell you a story today, which is one that I like a lot. It's one that you won't necessarily hear in lectures about optics and physics, but it's actually a story that sort of, in a way, reminds us all why we do physics, which is to see something that everybody has seen before, but maybe in a new and different way. So, and I'm gonna start by telling you a bit of a historical story, uh, which is to do with the Vikings. And I see we actually have Professor Steen Hansen uh, in the audience, who's actually a real Viking from uh, Denmark. And I apologize to Professor Hansen for any uh, liberties I might take with history in order to be able to tell a good um, physics story. So just to begin, um, just like to say, obviously we're all in uh, not together as we normally would be at a time like this. And we're the people on this call are probably from or sitting in all sorts of different places on this map of Europe or even beyond. So obviously we all, our hearts are all in Chernivtsi and presumably some of the audience are actually sitting in Chernivtsi, some of the students that we've got. Um, I, don't, I don't know exactly how it's, which OSA chapters are here, but do we have the OSA Chernivtsi chapter here? Maybe I'll, well, I'll keep, I'll assume so. So I'm, I work at the University of Birmingham in the United Kingdom which is just here in the middle of, of um, the United Kingdom. But one of the things to say is it's often um, easier if we want to relate our places to people to say uh, who comes from there. So I've looked, I've heard that um, the American actress Mila Kunis was born in Chernivtsi. So I guess in some sense she represents, um, represents uh, at least what people might think of when think of Chernivtsi, maybe not. And where I live in University of Birmingham or Birmingham City um, is famous as the original home of Ozzy Osbourne. Now, the people that I'm going to be talking about in this lecture don't come from any of these places. They actually come from this Scandinavia. And Scandinavia, we might say, uh, as a representative um, you might say is uh, Thor, but I'm not really talking about Thor, I'm talking about the Vikings, who are the historical um, historical uh, people who lived in um, the Scandinavia. So, and the, and the historical question is, when they were traveling, the Vikings, it was a lot easier about a thousand years ago to travel by sea than it was to travel by land because land is quite hard to travel over because of mountains and swamps and uh, people with spears who are trying to stop you. So Vikings did most of their exploration by sea. And so this is, the this is a slightly different version of the map. Um, so the North Pole is here, here's Britain again, and here's Scandinavia. And when Vikings did their exploration about, let's say about a thousand years ago, they mainly traveled purely east-west. So this curve on the map is a line that on the globe would be just um, a purely east-west line. And you can see they sailed at far out of sight of land, far away from land, and they didn't have the magnetic compass. So now if you're sailing out of sight of land, the natural way of orienting yourself is using a compass that orients itself with the Earth's magnetic field towards north. And so you can always tell which way north is and orient your boat accordingly. But how did the Vikings do that? 
when they were traveling purely east-west when they um, when they didn't have a compass. So obviously they used what they had access to, and the only thing they could see that might indicate that is the sun. And there's evidence from archaeologists that suggests that Vikings did use the sun as the main way of navigating when they were on their ship. Obviously, you have to have a good clock and you have to have a relatively good sense of astronomy to know where, where the sun is at a certain time of day, um, at a certain time of year. And um, as far as we know, the Vikings had a good working knowledge of that, although they didn't write anything down. There were Viking scientists, they just explained things by word of mouth. They didn't, we don't have any records in detail of what they said. And so this, this is um, something that was found in an archaeological dig that people think was a, a sort of a form of what they call a sun compass that we might say is um, we have a needle, uh, a gnomon that would point and the shadow would indicate um, if you know what time of day it is, you can orient it to find north. So that's how probably the Vikings mainly navigated at sea. But if you've ever been out outdoors, and certainly you can certainly see where, where I am looking out of the window here in Birmingham, most of the time it's very cloudy. And if it's cloudy, and it's certainly cloudy in the North Atlantic, it can be hard to see precisely where the sun is. Here you can see from this photo of the full sky that there is a small, you can see a small um, sort of patch here of brightness. This is probably where the sun is. But if there was much more cloud, that would be a lot harder to see. And so it turned out that an archaeologist in this um, Danish archaeology magazine, Skalk, we can ask Professor Hansen what Skalk means um, at the end, made a suggestion that maybe in cloudy weather, Vikings navigated using the polarization of the blue sky, using some objects called sunstones, which are mentioned in Icelandic sagas. So these sagas, the stories of the adventures of the Vikings are what was written down. And occasionally in these sagas, there's reference to these magical objects called sunstone. Well, it doesn't say they're magic, but it says they have unusual properties. And nobody knows what these sunstones are. And the suggestion here is maybe the sunstones are natural polarizers of light. So here's the picture of the um, Thor or one of his friends turning this natural polarizing crystal to try to detect polarized light. So here's a sample of an Icelandic saga translated into English, the saga Flateabok, the king made them fetch the stone and he held it up and saw where light radiated from the stone. So maybe that's to do with navigation, maybe it's not, but this was the suggestion, maybe this is to do with polarized light, which might be the way that the Vikings navigated at sea. So what are they looking at? And what is the, so we know the sky is blue, we know the sky is blue to do with Rayleigh scattering, but it turns out the sky is polarised as well in a particular way that enables you to figure out where the sun is, even if you don't see, even if you can't see it. And so polarisation, as I'm sure you know, I'm putting it here just to sort of make sure everybody's with me, is as Newton's words, light rays have sides. As a light ray comes towards you, it doesn't, it's, um, it's not just an amount of light, it's actually a vibration that has a direction. So we say light is a transverse wave, the vibration of the electric and magnetic field vectors are perpendicular to the direction of flow. So if this is the direction of the light propagation, the vibration here is in the plane of the screen, not perpendicular to it. And we, we, we of course have to use all sorts of 
devices and polarizers to try and see it, because although many optical phenomena around us all the time involve polarized light, our own eyes that are very good at detecting brightness and color, at least within a certain range of a spectrum, have not evolved to be able to see polarization. So what we have to use is special crystals embedded in plastic or glass called polarizers that you've probably come across in the laboratory. And these only allow one direction of vibration through. So if I've got this is the direction of polarized light coming out of the screen into your eye, it's, it's propagating out of the screen into your eye, but it's vibrating in this direction. And we put a polarizer, the polarizer that only allows light with this vertical direction, the brightness that it allows through is corresponds to dropping this perpendicular to make this a right angled triangle. Um, and that was one of the first laws of polarization when this was first um, investigated and understood by physicists um, about 200 years ago in the early 1800s, just after Thomas Young had established that light is a wave. Now, one of the reasons why we don't always think about polarization is because what I said before was a pure, clean, mathematical light wave, as you might see in textbooks. A natural light, light that comes out of our daily light sources, not necessarily even lasers in the lab, but coming out of the light bulbs um, or, the, or the sun and the stars, is actually a mixture of differently polarized light rays. Just as it might be a mixture of different frequencies if it's white light, it's a mixture of different polarizations. So in general, there are three sorts of polarization that you might encounter in, in natural light or in other forms of light. Fully polarized, like we've just talked about, which could be light that emerges from a polarizer itself. Unpolarized, which is just a complete mixture of all directions and something in the middle, which is partially polarized. So you can see here, it, the horizontal vibration is bigger than the vertical vibration, but here there is no vertical vibration at all. We just have horizontal vibration. Here it's a complete mixture of everything, but here we can still pick out it's most, it's, it would be have the greatest brightness horizontally and the least brightness vertically. And different sorts of polarization show up all over the place. So for example, fully polarized light is very important in actually the optics of devices around us all the time. Liquid crystal devices, such as uh, smartphone screens, um, liquid crystal watches, flat screen, uh, computers and televisions are all based on liquid crystals and electric electromagnetic fields controlling liquid crystals, which involves fully polarized light. And it takes advantage of the fact our eyes can't see polarization because if they could, the polarization that we would see, for example, on a TV screen would be very different from the polarization of the picture it represents. Completely unpolarized light. It can be light from a, a, a light bulb, light from certain sorts of lasers. And so, and, and light from the sun, although I'll come to that in a moment. And partially polarized light is in a way the most interesting. And a lot of reflected light is partially polarized. And that's why we use um, the shades, Polaroid, Polaroid shades, like these sunglasses that I've got because these are oriented. So when the light reflects, it tends to reflect, the, the brighter reflection is in the plane perpendicular to the reflection. So if the sun was coming in here, coming towards the eye, it would tend to be horizontally polarized more than vertically polarized. So with a hot, with a um, polarizer that only lets through vertical, it can really reduce reflection and reduce glare. And that's why um, it's particularly useful um, when you're at the sea or um, snowy, uh, when or skiing, to have um, polarized um, glasses. Oh, I should have said here also, reflected light 
So light from, say, a cloud is almost completely unpolarized as well. But what about the blue sky itself? So the pure light from the sun would be unpolarized, but because it goes through the atmosphere, just as the sky gets blue because light is filtered out from the, the sun uh, by scattering of uh, air molecules, what about the blue sky? And so this is an experiment that I did out of my office window on a clear day. So I'm holding here a sheet of polarizer. And this is the, um, the line represents the vibration direction that the polarizer passes. And I've got a video as I, and I'm gonna just gonna rotate the polarizer. And I've got to do it by video because I'd like to do it live, but unfortunately, this is a false background behind me and it is just cloud outside my window. So watching, you can see it gets brighter, it gets darker, and it gets brighter again. So I'm trying to align the polarizing where I think it's darkest. It's probably darkest there, which means if that's the direction that it's passed and it's darkest, the, the, this is partially polarized, so the, the most of the polarization here would be perpendicular to it, would be vibrating in that direction. And as it happens, the sun is off the screen in that direction. So at least approximately, the sun is in the direction perpendicular to the direction of the brightest direction of polarization, or it's aligned along the axis of the, of the darkest polarization. So the direction of polarization, the brightest polarization, is at least approximately at right angles to the direction of the sun. So that, so you can see, at least in principle, I could say a lot more about it, but at least in principle, you could see um, how this Viking navigation might work if we knew how well, these crystals were. Rather than talking about these crystals, I'll talk about how some other other um, ways that this can be navigated navigation. And the first actual investigation of polarization navigation was actually a study of bees, and it was by um, this gentleman Carl von Frisch, who was a German biologist who was awarded the Nobel Prize for Physiology and Medicine almost 50 years ago for his study of the ways that bees behave, particularly honeybees. And he studied, for example, this funny dance that the bees did and analyzed what that means in terms of the information. And it turns out aspects of this dance, as he analyzed it, is to do with their navigation in the sky. And again, they navigate the sky from any patch of blue they can see, regard that, you know, but they but they want to be able to reconstruct where the sun would be. So this is what von Frisch says. Bees are able to perceive polarized light. The sky, which to our eyes is a uniform blue, is distinctly patterned to them. They use this extensively and in their orientation guide themselves not only by the sun's position, but also by the resulting polarization patterns of the blue sky. They continue to recognize the sun's position after it has set or when it's obscured by a mountain, or I guess because of clouds. Once again, bees appear to us miraculous, but it is now clear that ants and other insects, <coughs> crayfish, spiders, and even octopuses perceive polarized light and use it for orientation. And that among all these animals, the human being is the unendowed one. So lots of different creatures have evolved eyes um, in all sorts of different ways. And in fact, many eyes, particularly of different sorts of insects and other um, arthropods, um, actually are amazingly polarization sensitive. Squid especially a particularly polarization sensitive. They're not so good at making images. Our eyes are very good at making images, but without that polarization information. And so von Frisch discovers this. And again, the bees want to use the polarization in exactly the same way that the Vikings might want to, is as soon as there's a small patch of blue sky, 
it's patterned, as he says, it looks patterned to them. And that pattern of polarization tells you the sun is somewhere perpendicular to that direction. If you've got two patterns, two patches of blue, you can figure out exactly where the sun should be from trigonometry, not just using your eyes. So maybe Viking sunstones were polarizing materials. Now we're not archeologists, we're physicists. So we can't answer the question, but we can at least test whether it's plausible or not. And there's investigations of the sorts of materials that Vikings had available to them that, um, that could, shows that maybe this, this worked. It wouldn't have been a natural polarizing material. It would have been a natural birefringent material. Um, and I could talk more about it. In fact, I want to talk about something slightly different, if that's okay. Um, so, but just to remind you, we can see you doing this sort of analysis, we could try to map out not just what is the, uh, what is the polarization direction at this point, but we could actually, if it's a sufficiently blue, day, blue sky day, we could do this analysis at every point in the sky every orient every direction we could do a little polarization analysis a little bit of polarimetry to establish what are the uh, mixture of polarizations the orientation and the difference between the brightest and the darkest at every point in the sky oh i just forgot to say so this is the what i'm not going to say is that the the vikings probably if they did anything would have used a piece of of birefringent crystal. So here I'm doing a similar demonstration with calcite or called Iceland spar in English. Birefringence breaks an image into two. I've got two lines here and I was trying to find the, the, the direction where one was maximally bright and one was minimally, minimally bright and it works the same way. But in, so let's just say where we are, where we've got to before we move to the second part of the talk. Light is polarized at right angles to its direction of flow, its direction of propagation. Skylight is a mixture of polarizations, brighter and darker in different directions with the maximum and minimum at right angles. And we humans can only see polarization through certain materials. And maybe the Vikings had some shades which the archaeologists have yet to find that would that would indicate that they use this they use this fact but now we understand that fact let's study the physics of skylight polarization without worrying about the history let's try to understand why is it polarized and if we can draw this pattern of lines what does that pattern of lines look like So we can't see the polarization in the sky, but how do the bees see it? What would the sky look like to the bees or to us if we could see the direction of maximum polarization? And here's a representation of it. This is the, so this again is a representation of the full sky. So if I think of measuring the sky in angles, the Vert angle with the vertical is proportional to the radius. And here's the horizon. You can see some trees and some buildings. And the, and the angle here is the azimuthal angle. And this is a measurement made um, by um, uh, a camera that, had, that, went, that went all the way around the sky and had a little and rotated a polarizer to be able to pick out the direction of the maximum polarization. So we don't have the minimum polarization or the or its difference. We're just showing the directions of maximum polarization, which are these little red lines. And what I've done is I've used um, the mathematical theory of this to fill in the blue lines, which capture maybe a little bit more what the pattern should look like. And you can see wherever the sun is, it's sort of at right angles. Got to be careful because this projection maybe messes angles up a bit. And it certainly does not look like it's at right angles close to the sun. I should say here, the sun's hidden by this little shadow here so it doesn't saturate the camera. 
So around here, in the near the direction of the sun, it seems to go wrong. In fact, I always think it looks a little bit like a fingerprint. Looks like the, the polarization lines are just like the, 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 the tip of your finger. But I find this picture remarkable because if we had evolved to see polarization, if or if, if we think of any animal that could see polarization, this is the pattern that they would see whenever they looked at the sky. There will be there will be songs about it. There will be poetry about it. There will be mythology about it, like there's mythology for the rainbow. But we can't see it. And in fact, this image that I made with my collaborators about 20 years ago was, as far as we know, the first time this pat pattern of the blue sky was mapped out um, like it would actually look. And so you can see that this is for physics to reveal things that are there for everybody to see, but maybe we're just not looking in quite the right way. So let's try and look and see a little bit more about this pattern. So why is, what, what's going on? What is the physics? So skylight, the light that we measure from a direction in the sky that's not the direction of the sun, is a mixture of different linear polarizations. There's no elliptic polarization or circular polarization. Station. It's just different orientations of linear polarization with different intensities, different strengths in different orientations. And all of those are at right angles to the light's propagation direction, just as we've said. Light in the blue sky, all the light in the sky ultimately comes from the sun. So this, all this blue light is coming from the sun. It's just that as the light from the sun has entered the Earth's atmosphere, it's scattered off air molecules, maybe scattered once, twice, or maybe many times. And in fact, the scattering is encouraged for higher frequencies. The, more, the higher the frequency, the greater the scattering. So blue has a higher frequency, and that's why the sky tends to be blue. The big red sun site, there's more scattering, so even the red is scattered out from the sun. So if we look at the pattern of polarizations, so that the light ray comes along here, or a mixture of all the different polarizations on this light ray, and let's say it scatters in this direction. So just as we said with reflection, when the light scatters, it tends to get more polarized in the direction perpendicular to the plane of the scattering it tend or it tends to get squashed in the direction that's in the plane of the scattering and you can work that out um analytically sorry we just jumped in a little bit too too keenly my um my video so so let's just just look up here for now so what we're what we're so what we actually have if you think not just in two dimensions, but a single point in sky, the scattered light could be coming from many, many directions. It's come from the sun, it's scattered many times, and ultimately ends up in this final scattering point. So it's a mixture of polarizations in all directions, but with all the rays coming in in all sorts of directions, actually those vibrations are completely mixed up in three-dimensional space. But what we see is only what is comes out from the scattering in the direction we're looking. So say the ray is leaving this point and coming straight out of the screen into your eye. So this is an ellipsoid mixture of all of these vectors. What you would see in terms of polarization is exactly the same as you actually would draw when you draw an ellipsoid. Because let's say I have a three-dimensional object like my phone. What you actually see if you look at this phone, you don't see a three-dimensional object. You just see the projection of that object into the plane perpendicular to what you're, you're looking at. And if I look in a different direction, it has a completely different shape. So here it looks like a rectangle with longer horizontal than it is vertical here it looks well it has the set it, it's again longer than it's vertical but a lot more strongly 
If I tilt it this way, let's get the angles right, tilt it this way, it actually is shorter vertically than it is shorter vertically than it is longer vertically than it is horizontally. Horizontal big, vertical small. Verti uh, vertical big, horizontal small. So at some point in the middle, it projects and should look a bit like a square. So you can see if I projected that there and that looks a bit like a square. So you can imagine looking at all of the different directions and drawing the shape that you see of, um, from this phone. We're gonna play the same game, well, the polarization pattern that comes out from playing the same game from this ellipsoid mixture of these vibrations at this point. So what do you see if you look at this ellipsoid with this direction? You see this outline, which is an ellipse. And that ellipse corresponds to the mixture of polarizations for the scattered light coming out in that direction. So I can now come to my picture and it's a little bit complicated, but it's but there's nothing more to it than what I've already said, is that what I've got here in the middle, you can see is an ellipsoid. It's almost like a, it looks quite circular, but it's a little bit longer vertically than it is horizontally in this picture, but it's quite squashed in the third direction. And what I've done is I've drawn a cage around this ellipse such that the point on this cage, let's say here, the, the direction of that, of that cage's bar, that black line, corresponds to the orientation of what looks to be the longest axis when we're drawing this ellipsoid in that direction. Now I change my viewpoint, the longest axis, oops, the longest, the apparent longest axis changes, sorry. The apparent longest axis changes its, um, uh, changes what appears to be its orientation. So here, the longest axis is definitely vertical and it looks vertical here. But looking, but what you might think is the middle just here, as I said, it looks almost circular, but it's slightly longer than it is, slightly longer vertically than it is horizontally, which means that I have this vertical bar here. Now I can't change the orientation, but if you were to look at it in this special direction here, that special direction, the projection ellipsoid would look circular. Just like this special projection from my phone looks square. And that special projection means that there is no preferred direction of the polarization. It's what we call a polarization singularity. And a lot of this conference that we've been at for the last week has been discussing polarization singularities in different sorts of settings and how they're useful in various different sorts of optical physics. But here we have this polarization singularity, this, this, this point, this, this dot in the fingerprint. In fact, we've got um, it representing here the polarization pattern of the sky. And the reason why the polarization pattern looks this way is because at each point in the sky, this ellipsoid is a pretty good representation of the vibrations that come from scattering the, the sun's sunlight that scatter. It's almost, it's almost the sunlight, it's almost the same in every direction, but because there's a little bit more scattering horizontally in the in the atmosphere than vertically, because effectively the air is only about 10 kilometers deep but it's about 300 kilometers wide before the cutoff from the Earth's curvature, means that there's slight, it's slightly longer this way than it is this way. And it's not so deep 
because that would represent light that comes from the sun and scatters forwards and backwards in the direction of the sun. So we can use this polarization pattern of light to reconstruct this ellipsoid, which represents the light that's scattered at different points in the atmosphere. And the analysis of this just using geometry is sufficient almost completely to characterize the polarization pattern in the sky. So blue sky is quite a simple phenomenon. We've just got one source of light, the sun, and it's just scattering by bouncing back and forward. But there are other sorts of skies we can look at. And one of the most interest, interesting ones is the cosmic microwave background, the radiation that, came, that was originally came from the Big Bang and was scattered, or the last time it was scattered, by the very hot plasma in the very early universe. And so these patches are actually coming there, the, the cosmic microwave background temperature. So these red bits are hot and the blue bits are cold, but they also have polarizations. And this is quite an old um, image about 15 years ago of the so-called WMAP mission from NASA that measured, measured this, this very detailed temperature map, but also a bit of a coarse polarization map. So you can see the polarization is a lot more complicated than the Rayleigh scattered blue sky. But again, you can see there's horizontal and vertical here. So there's a polarization singularity there. There'll be another one there and so on. And using <coughs> analysis of these patterns, we can try to make some sense of, these, um, of this very complicated scattering picture. So say so this is electromagnetic radiation from the Big Bang scattered by uh, plasma in the early universe. This is Lambert scattering rather than Rayleigh scattering. And this is actually the most recent um, map that um, NASA has released, and one of the most recent ones coming from the Planck mission. What's gone on here is actually a lot of the, the light from the Milky Way has been removed, but what you can see here uh, in red is the light from the Milky Way and actually you can see there's very strong polarization there, but in the background here is again, the cosmic microwave background with its polarization pattern. So that's what I wanted to tell you about, but I really want to leave you with this picture because this is, the, this is a representation of the physics of the blue sky, but one which we can understand now we, now we know about polarization but as i say until we as physicists looked at this it was completely mysterious or, or completely unknown and was the stuff of nobel prizes to figure out that other animals actually see it whenever they see the blue sky so polarized light is all around us can be seen by many non-mammal eyes using polarizers and polaroids we can see polarization too the fingerprint polarization pattern of skylight is caused by scattering in the atmosphere, the same explanation as the blue of the sky. And we tried to understand this pattern using pictures and geometry, thinking about the three dimensional geometry of Rayleigh scattering. And polarization of scattered light is also important to understand the Big Bang and the cosmic sky. So, thank you very much for listening. Are there any questions? Thank you, Mark. Maybe questions? Yeah, can I ask a question, please? Yes, Igor. Yes, uh, hi, Mark. Uh, thank you for a nice hi. presentation. Uh, just a quick question. So, uh, about the Vikings. So, you know that there is also known phenomena like Heidinger brushes that people are able to see. So, and what do you yeah. think? Uh, is it possible that Vikings use two phenomena like this uh, hydrogen brushes yes. and so, uh, my fringes crystal? Right. Mm -hmm. So, so we sh I should be. So, I was careful of what I said. What I said is there's no evidence that we evolved to see polarized light. So, this hiding a brush you're talking about is a phenomenon that, um, well, I think Heidinger killed himself because he 
went crazy because every time he looked at the blue sky, he could see this coloured, what they call brush in front of him. And what it is to do with is that the cone cells in the retina of our eye are slightly elliptical. So they have a slightly preferred direction of polarization, but the cone cells are also color sensitive. So it's actually to do with the packing of the cone cells in the retina that lead to this hiding a brush effect. Now I've spoken to biologists saying, is, this any ev is there any evidence that mammals evolved to see the polarization, that this was some sort of favorable, um, favor favorable to evolution? But there's no evidence that, um, there's no evidence it is. It's just a, maybe an accidental phenomenon that we can see it. Yep, okay, thank you. Questions? Okay, thank you, Mark. And uh, the okay. second, our speaker today, Vera Bissaga from Germany. Please, Vera. Yeah, hi, can you hear me well? Hello? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah cool. Uh, so I will share my screen and uh, yeah, just a second. So you should see something now. Okay, so uh, good afternoon uh, to everyone and thank you for joining this talk. Um, today, I wanted to share something with you about practical applications. And uh, uh, so I wanted to talk about the off-axis digital holography for three-dimensional transmission microscopy. And I really um, emphasize the practical insights because I wanted to share something that you could actually if you would like to follow uh, what I'm talking today about and actually just repeat the same and um, maybe go further. So um, why digital holography, why we are concerned about that? So there are several key beneficial features of it. Uh, and um, if we will talk about uh, uh, this technique as um, an optical technique, there are some common points. Uh, first, it can be non-destructive uh, to the sample. If we apply a certain spectral range and power of the light source that we have, it is, of course, contactless because we do not need to uh, touch somehow the sample. And since we can have the um, especially resolved sensors, uh, meaning just the camera sensor like CCD or CMOS, we can have a really relatively high speed of data acquisition from a single shot from a more or less uh, large area of the sample. But when we talk about digital holography, we have also some exceptional properties. And one of them is an extraordinary access to the face. As we um, know about that uh, uh, light was uh, light is a transverse wave, there is not only intensity, this, uh, there is also a phase. And when we are doing any imaging just with a very um, uh, common uh, techniques like photography, we usually have just a projection of our intensity on a um, photographic plate or some electronic uh, digital uh, uh, systems. It doesn't matter, we have always a projection, but we do not have any access to the three-dimensional information and phase is exactly that point uh, that talks us about what the three-dimensional property the space has where the light was passing through. And uh, taking into account this, that phase is also just naturally a differential uh, point and feature, uh, the digital holography has also naturally high axial resolution and it is also high sensitive. And when we talk about digital holography, it's really uh, an uh, ad, uh, advanced method. So there is a wide variety of applications that uh, cover its non-destructive characterization of technical samples. You can uh, see, for example, here on the right, an image reconstructed from the hol hologram of um, uh, um, uh, some contacts, metallic contacts on the semiconductor, or for example, this uh, below is a three-dimensional representation of a micro lens. Um, uh, um, manufactured from glass. We can also talk about biomedical imaging when the phase information can talk um, uh, can be used in order to retrieve the shape of the blood cells uh, that are uh, taken from a human and with this to diagnose any uh, illness or any um, uh, changes in, in the cells or even changes in some uh, slices uh, performed from organs, like here you can see on um, on the uh, on the right image, where with the color representing the face information, we can detect different uh, lines and uh, changes in the uh, organ slice. We can also talk about 
displacement and um, of the object monitoring and also tracking uh, of the movements um, where uh, this is an example of an image where the uh, different particles and cells were um, moving in Brownian movements uh, through a certain area of monitoring. And uh, since the data uh, acquired with digital holography can be acquired fastly, we can also uh, really track where the cell was in a previous moment of time. And with this, we can investigate uh, the behavior of very certain uh, instances. We can also get the three-dimensional tomographic imaging. And here, for example, uh, the image of a fiber, glass fiber used for communications, where the graded uh, uh, index fiber profile was reconstructed thanks to the uh, digital holography, uh, where the sample has been imaged with different angles of um, illumination. And then a certain algorithm has been uh, used in order to reconstruct this three dimensional information on the sample. We can also talk about measurement of the flows, vibrating objects rotation, and um, the phase can take us um, uh, deep into the flow motion of some liquids, where here the phase can give us also the information about the viscosity and its um, uh, distribution. We can also have fluorescent digital holography and multicolor microscopy, but also we can even go so deep uh, as deep tissue analysis where uh, neurons into the, in the brain of a human can be visualized with digital holography, but also to astronomy. And this is, um, uh, for example, a phase image reconstructed uh, uh, the, um, from the moon, which was captured uh, with the help of the telescope. And this is just a very, a very short representation of a very broad range where the digital holography can be applied for. Nevertheless, the principle behind is uh, quite um, uh, the same. And um, although it is so broadly investigated, there is always a path where to go. So if you would like to, um, if, if you would feel that you like the topic, you, there is still enough to investigate. And there are for challenges as for any imaging technique, there is always um, errors that uh, appear in the wavefront uh, of the lights that you capture with your sensor, which are called aberrations, and you have to uh, deal with them. You, you have uh, also to uh, speed up the process in order to get to the real-time regime. You can also have an idea to apply the method somewhere online, for example, if you, you would like to measure some technical uh, samples within manufacturing line. And of course, it would be very nice to have a method which is universal independently on the nature of the sample you are interested in. And within this talk, I would wanted to show you an example of a solution where a goal of a high precision and high speed um, a measurement approach was implemented especially for the transmission digital holography, which helped also to broaden the fields of application of digital holography and also to enable application to several new materials and devices. And to give you an overview of what I will talk today about, I will first um, comment on the general concepts of the digital holography. It may happen that uh, uh, some of you already had the course of holography, but still, um, then I would introduce this idea of pre-calibration approach and uh, briefly discuss its concept and show you some, um, depending on how much time I would have, I will briefly show you several applications to give you an idea how this can be used in real life. And of course, I would give some conclusions. So to start with the general concepts of digital holography, the digital holography is nothing else. It's just a imaging technique where the process of recording the information of the, about the sample and its reconstruction is separated in time and also can be separated in place. And it can be separated into two steps. The first step is interference, uh, which it, uh, took place between the object wave, meaning the light, uh, wave which gathers and uh, govern, um, which is governed with information about the sample. It may be uh, transmitted, it may be scattered, it may be reflected, it doesn't matter. It gets the information about its surface or internal structure. And this wave interferes with some another reference wave, which is coherent to it, but it has a pre-known um, 
it, it is known to us, pre-known to us in terms of its phase profile. For example, here it is a um, plane wave uh, just shortly represented. And the phase difference between these two waves, which actually gives you the information about the profile of this object, so this is very schematical, but still, it is encoded then within the intensity distribution of the interference pattern. This appear then like lines of bright and dark lines, maybe sometimes curved, of, or uh, if the object is really complex, it can be a very complicated pattern that arises, but it is in, encoded in um, a very uh, straight form where uh, this uh, depends on the interference equation, if um, you would like to follow it, it's a very basic equation. And this pattern is called hologram as soon as it is recorded somewhere. In the very beginning, it has been recorded on the holographic plate. And um, the second step would be to shine to this holographic uh, plate or photographic plate with the same reference uh, wave that was used for the recording and the diffraction of this wave plate uh, of this wave, sorry, on, on the uh, pattern that was recorded gives you actually the, the um, uh, image of the object you were investigated. And it's very interesting that the object is reconstructed uh, absolutely identically, and also it has a volumetric features. It has a parallax, you can look at it at different angles, and it will look really like a three-dimensional uh, image. And uh, it is also very practical that the process of this diffraction has a very precise and uh, defined analytical solution, meaning that you can have it written as an equation. And as soon as you can have it as an equation, you can also think about in the future that you can do it digital or numerical. Just to give a little bit more, um, just uh, comments and background, uh, the geometry that uh, I was just talking about when your object and reference wave are propagating more or less along the same optical axis, and thus also the diffraction takes place for, uh, for the uh, main um, direction uh, is this, uh, the same, is um, commonly referred to as Gabor or inline holography because uh, the Dennis Gabor was the person who invented the procedure of reconstruction of the whole optical field in 1948. And uh, uh, to celebrate his uh, invention, it is now called the Gabor hologram. But there are several drawbacks in this um, geometry that you may directly see diffraction has several orders, as you might know. And if you will precisely look at this image of the reconstruction procedure, you would have the overlapping of the zeros, um, minus first and plus first diffraction orders actually propagating along the same direction. This means that in fact, you would have the reconstruction of your image, some distorted wave, which is of another opposite uh, diffraction order and also the background um, uh, governed by the reference wave, they are all sep not separated in space, they are all overlapped and it appears that it is not that easy to separate them and to understand uh, where the information belongs to, to the first or minus first degree of diffraction. Uh, there was also another initial drawback that usually this geometry could be at the very beginning used for mainly transparent objects. And it was later that late and Dupatnik in, um, introduced an, an met a method in order to first um, separate these diffraction orders in space during the reconstruction procedure, but also it became possible to um, measure the reflective samples. And the idea is very simple. You have the reference and object be uh, beams overlapping with a certain angle and the reconstruction takes place with the same angle. And then um, at the mirrored angle, uh, you have the reconstructed object and you can really, um, by playing with this angle of overlapping, separate it from any undesired information in your, uh, during the reconstruction. Um, another thing uh, is how to practically realize everything. In fact, the same geometry can be realized with hundreds of different optical schemes. And just to have a very, uh, several examples of what will be covered later, you can image uh, the hologram in the image plane registration, where you have 
not just the scattering or reflection of your sample on the holographic plate, but you have an image in that plane and you have an overlapping of the image with a reference plane, or you can have uh, the hologram um, recorded without any image at all, or even uh, without any recognizable shape of your sample, where you have um, um, the hologram recorded with collimated beams. In this case, if you would reconstruct such a hologram, you would require the same optics used as for imaging in order to get back from the collimated beams to the, um, uh, to the image plane and to have, in fact, your uh, sample reconstructed. Coming back to, to what I, I said a, a couple of minutes before, since we have a very uh, analyt this, a precise analytical description of the diffraction, we can think about digital um, reconstruction of the image. And here we get two options of what we can reconstruct. We can actually um, use the, the, the uh, equation of the uh, diffraction in order to calculate it just for the geometry that we uh, use for reconstruction. In this case, we would uh, in fact use uh, get out a virtual image, which is most probably mirror to what you had at the beginning. But you may think about that if in experiment, it might be a little bit difficult and digital uh, in numerical space, it's much easier. You can just get a complex con conjugate of your reference and send it from the opposite direction. And in this case, you would in fact get uh, the image of your object exactly the same as it would be, exactly in that space as it would be. But in this case, you would need, uh, you would, um, need to play around with these complex conjugates uh, just with the mathematical properties of the, of the waves you, re, uh, you use for reconstruction. And um, in all these important uh, equations, the most uh, the, the most significant part is this multiplication between the function of the hologram and this reference wave. And why it allows us to reconstruct the image, we will look here at the moment. So to decouple what comes into this equation of diffraction. It, of course, depends on the wavelengths. And this was one of the important properties that the Dennis Gabo was using at the very beginning. He was playing around an electron microscope and he was uh, changing the electron um, and uh, visible wavelengths in order to uh, play around with uh, aberration correction and uh, magnification. Then you might suspect that there are already several Fourier uh, representation. You have this hologram transmission function. You have the reference wave that you need uh, to know exactly when you uh, record your hologram. You have then this uh, marked area here. And if you would uh, look at it, it looks uh, similar to the wave equation in case of a spherical wave. And this is nothing else than the just representation of the chanel huygens principle where you think about propagation of the wave light through a space uh, using the secondary spherical wavelengths. And here, in order to precisely describe it, you need to uh, have this uh, radius of your position, which is dependent on the coordinates um, on the point uh, source where your hologram is placed um, as an aperture and the source point. And as a result, you don't get an intensity distribution, you get a complex value, which is called complex amplitude. And here is a very nice feature of the digital holography, this exceptional feature of access to the phase comes into play. If you play with this complex uh, amplitude and just get it um, uh, square, you would get nothing else than uh, the intensity information as if you would use any imaging, uh, very straightforward imaging techniques. But if you would instead looking for its argument, you, could, uh, you would get the access to the face. And if you are applying this numerical representation in digital space, you, um, you have this face distribution directly. You have it as numbers um, uh, captured into the array uh, and matrices, and you can calculate with them and represent in any way you want and also analyze and maybe perform some uh, further after processing uh, with numerical virtual lenses or anything that you might be uh, have difficulties to do in experiment in life. And 
okay, we have this access to the face information, and now the question may, may arise, what can we use it for? And one of the information, um, so just in, um, uh, to, to uh, keep us uh, glued to the transmission case, I have prepared several examples of the sample. So here you might have, uh, for example, the sample of known refractive index, but completely unknown thickness. In this case, just from the wave equation, you could reconstruct the change of the thickness of your sample. If you might have extra information on, um, on your sample on one of the uh, uh, planes of its shape, for example, you know that you have a transparent sample lying on a covered glass under the microscope, then you know that definitely one plane is straight, and then this change of the thickness is nothing else than just the topography of the sample, meaning you can reconstruct its three-dimensional shape. Vice versa, if you know, for example, that you have a constant uh, thickness of the sample, but you have still these differences in phase reconstructed, then definitely there is an inner structure that you can reconstruct as a gradient of the refractive index, and you can um, analyze your sample for uh, some inclusions. And if you know even more about your sample, you know its shape, and you know that there should be some inclusions by uh, of a certain uh, refractive index and um, thickness, you can analyze it for local localization. Like here, you have an inclusion in form of a sphere, and you know its radius, you know its uh, refractive index. And from knowing that, the phase information, similar to the case B for the topography, can be used just to, to find out where the, uh, the sphere is located, meaning the in-depth position within the host material. And um, as I mentioned, one of the challenges for digital holography is actually the aberration correction. Aberration is the errors uh, which appear in the light field when it propagates through the, for example, turb turbulent air, uh, or it is uh, propagating through non-ideal optical components. And you have to take care of that. Otherwise, you get the phase distortions and uh, the phase map you get about your sample has nothing to do with the sample under, uh, under study. And of course, there are a lot of um, techniques to do that. One of them is um, the double exposure technique, which can be very straightforwardly used as a reflection geometry. The idea here is that you get two holograms, one for the very flat um, uh, reflective surface and another one for um, uh, the sample on this flat reflective surface or on another calibrate um, or with respect to another calibration sample. And after reconstructing of the phase maps, you can just uh, uh, <clears throat> compare them and with that subtract, subtract and get the information on your sample. Another option is with the transmission uh, geometry, uh, where exactly we are now interested in. And here the uh, game is a little bit more difficult because it is very uh, affordable from the manufacturing point of view to, uh, to get a very clear, very ident uh, ideal calibration uh, sample that you could uh, use for the, um, for the double exposure technique. And uh, the most uh, commonly used approach is uh, to uh, analyze the aberrations that can appear in your system with uh, numerical uh, representation of Ternicke polynomials. Then they are then used in order to virtually create a, a numerical lens, which is freeform and um, may have a very weird form. And then you apply this virtual uh, lens to your phase map, and it completely um, uh, ac uh, accounts for the aberrations that you might have in your um, uh, light field. Although you might imagine that a lot of integrals to calculate and also to apply the free form numerical lens uh, increases the computation time and also you are uh, really highly dependent on the accuracy, how uh, nicely you can fit this Tanneke polynomials uh, that you get to, to, the phase, uh, to the phase map you are measuring. And that's why there was an alternative that was uh, suggested in order to relax these requirements of the transparent calibration sample and just uh, to have something in, the, in between uh, the Tanneke polynomials calculation and uh, reflection geometry. And uh, it suggests that under certain conditions, uh, the 
uh, substrate of the sample can be already used as a calibration sample, even though if it's not flat or uh, has some drawbacks. And um, exactly now, I would like to um, shortly introduce this concept of pre-calibration. Um, the idea of the whole procedure is very simple, but it's uh, represented here with a little bit uh, a, a complex algorithms, but nevertheless, it started just very the same as a reflection based double exposure technique. So you have, in fact, to capture only three images with your camera independently on what uh, um, optical scheme you have for uh, hologram re um, uh, recording. One hologram is the hologram of your sample you're interested in. <clears throat> Sorry. For example, in this case, there were several grooves in material, transparent grooves in transparent materials. And um, you can see them directly here on example. So this is just a cut out of a real hologram uh, captured with uh, the experimental setup I was working in. And then you have to capture this, uh, the hologram of the same size, but of the same sample, but a little bit outside of the uh, region of interest. So you should not have any information of the localized sample you would like to have in this um, reference hologram. And of course, you need to capture the reference field, which is captured just once, and you can use it for many, many um, series of hologram reconstructions. And then you perform to this hologram a very basic reconstruction procedure as is used um, um, very often for off-axis geometry. In this case, it was angular spectrum method. Um, it is um, um, hidden here under this angular spectrum transfer function. And so in the long story, story short, it is just a representation of the field which is propagated as a sum of uh, a series of plane waves that propagate at different angles. And it propagates just in, so, uh, hundreds of these waves uh, with uh, all the wavelengths, uh, uh, with all the angles, and this is covered here in the Fourier space just with Fourier frequencies. And when you uh, perform the reconstruction procedure, you have to do only several steps. The very first step, you have to actually take use of this separation in space of the diffraction patterns of the plus one and minus one and zeros order of diffraction when you reconstruct the hologram. And for this, you perform Fourier transform. When you come into the Fourier transform, all the frequencies uh, that you get here represent the directions. And since you have different directions of propagation of the diffraction orders for object and unused twin image, you can just cut out the window that you would like to use for reconstruction. And here you see an example of uh, uh, the first order, which is just cut out, and everything else in the, in the Fourier space is replaced with zero. And you directly can see how this is different for the reference hologram and the hologram of a sample. In, here in, in the um, uh, first order spectrum of the sample, you see some squares, some lines, which represent the structure and all, uh, also important periodic structure of your sample. Whereas here, you don't see this at all. You have just uh, uh, some more or less quasi homogeneous representation. Uh, of course, you have some artifacts on the square because you have uh, bounded limited aperture and uh, in order to get rid of this, you would need to have an infinite uh, uh, area, which unfortunately is not possible with uh, available commercial, commercially available sensors and cameras. And what you do, you just use um, um, uh, this uh, chosen spectrums, uh, parts of the spectrums, you, you perform the inverse Fourier transform to come back to the just very common for us uh, spatial environment. Uh, there you multiply it with information on your reference field because you do need to know, uh, the, uh, you do need to find these changes in phase. You apply here once again the Fourier transform to come back to this useful uh, properties of um, uh, the frequency um, domain and apply there the angular spectrum function. And with help of it, you can simulate that uh, the light uh, comes through your hologram and propagates at a certain distance. For example, at 10 centimeters or at one centimeter, or it depends on your geometry and what you would like to get. And coming back, you get to this complex uh, electromagnetic field representation, this complex amplitude that we were talking about. And when you look for its um, um, 
uh, on its argument, you get the phase map. And here's come exactly what, so till Z, it is quite common for any holographic reconstruction. And here comes into play something similar to the double exposure technique. You have your sample phase map with aberrations, errors, any other information you are not interested in, and the phase map obtained from the substrate of the sample. And if you just subtract one from another, you get rid of anything you, do, you are not interested in. For example, as once again, the, the aberrations, some inhomogeneity into, in the sample substrate and, and so on. Taking into account that the phase map actually is uh, bounded with the modular of two pi, you have to unwrap them in order not to have the uh, saw-like uh, uh, gradient, but to have really reconstruction. And at the end, you get a phase map of your object. Here is a 2D demonstration, but with color, it is um, uh, decoded. You can just reconstruct it with another function um, in 3D, and you would see this as volleys. And this is the phase information that can be then uh, recalculated either into the refractive index and either into special information. This depends on what you know. Since we know the refractive index, we can directly say that this map would be the topography map. And what is very uh, important with this simple procedure, the reconstruction of uh, one hologram takes no longer than just 20, uh, 250 milliseconds. This is, all, uh, this is almost real time, so this is quasi real time, just uh, four frames per second, but it's still really fast and it's very simple. So there are no special um, numerical procedure inside and uh, you just get several classical Mathematical transforms and you get the information from your hologram. The most important, you have to be careful with recording the hologram. It should be of enough good quality. Otherwise, um, if the contrast of your hologram would, would not be enough, of course, you would not get any information about that. And uh, to make uh, a short summary of why this approach is quite interesting, you get the, once again, the targeted extraction of the useful phase information you are interested in. It stays simple. You don't need to simulate any uh, fitting procedure with standard polynomials or with uh, a ritual lens. You don't also need to make many of the measurements. It's enough to make a, a single shot for your sample. And in case you have a series of samples on one substrate, it even uh, multiplies the speed and you get a lot of them um, reconstructed from the same set of calibration hologram and reference and reference field, and it stays really high precise. And how this looks in uh, terms of experiments, this is uh, this can be performed in any um, um, uh, in any uh, interferometer. I have performed it, for example, in the Machtsandra, and uh, uh, with a little bit modifications uh, of Michelson like. You get the image in one. Uh, arm and uh, the reference uh, beam comes from another, they are multiplied at the CMOS camera, whereas uh, the uh, Microson add like uh, Microson like add ons are used just to precisely define the delay line because you have to adjust for the thickness of your sample in order to still have the beams um, coherent with, its, uh, with itself. And depending on uh, the source you are using, you have to really take care about that. And um, an example of uh, infrared, uh, near infrared laser, the accuracy could be achieved uh, below one degree of phase. Uh, in order to show you for what one can use this. So for example, I would start with static samples characterization, which is the very simple. So as we were talking at the very beginning, you can use this um, phase map for topography imaging and also for allocation. And uh, here are several examples of very uh, uh, interesting uh, uh, applications. So one is, uh, for example, um, um, uh, reconstruction of the samples that are made of a different material than uh, the substrate, but they have a similar or very close refractive index. And with digital holography and this subtracting of the calibration hologram, you can get this information out. You can have Otherwise, uh, another limitation of very specially confined structures for which you need to have really accurate optics and um, diffraction uh, limited performance of your imaging optics. Uh, you can use um, uh, the object allocation for uh, analysis of the dispersed uh, media. 
And also you can use this, method, um, this method even for analysis of the semiconductors in transmission. This is especially interesting because um, if you might know, semiconductors have a um, band gap that does not allow actually the visible light come uh, through uh, uh, the material. And if you would like to analyze it, you have to use uh, the near infrared light and farther, but there you have problems with the efficiency of the sensors. But since this method is very sensitive, you can still apply it with near infrared light and a very common single sensor and just take use of this sensitivity in order still to get results on the uh, semiconductor sample. So what about uh, what is interesting about specially confined structures? So if you have a high gradient of your surface uh, profile and high aspect ratio of the grooves, it is not really possible to uh, to use the common techniques for this. The common techniques would be atom force microscope or a laser scanning technique but they are limited with the si uh, size of the probe of the uh, or, um, either in case of atomic force microscope or the time needed to scan it um, with this tactile technique point by point. Otherwise, you are limited with uh, high numerical approaches that you might need for the laser, uh, laser scanning technique. And it appears that despite uh, using a uh, near infrared wavelengths, which definitely has a uh, much larger um, uh, diffraction spot and thus uh, lower resolution in space, the digital holography can still reproduce these uh, grooves just very uh, close to the uh, atomic force microscope measurement with the accuracy of in average 95%, which was no less than 95.0. And indeed, uh, making uh, speeding up the procedure several times because for one such sample, it was necessary at least several minutes, whereas this one you get in 250 milliseconds. And um, to prove that it's indeed working, it is also ne uh, necessary to show you how this looks like. So this is an inverted image because this with grooves, but just to show you how easy you can um, uh, look at the face uh, map, uh, at the face uh, surface around the sample and the quality of the surface, you, you are using this 3D representation, which you can also use as a 2D image. And to show that this breaks uh, on the same, uh, sorry, on the same uh, uh, grooves like here, it was on the uh, control uh, lines. It was measured with uh, both techniques. And you can see here the statistics. It's really very close. And uh, um, it's, the, the error is less than two nanometers at the wavelength of 800. 32, which is really nice and it speeds up the characterization process. Um, another example is you can apply this due to the fast procedure for dynamic processes monitoring. And uh, the examples um, come here and range from photopolymerization monitoring, where you can in real life see how the, poly the refractive index of your polymer, polymer, uh, polymer is changing. Uh, you can use it even for mapping of the carrier uh, amounts in your semiconductors when you inject them, like it is performed in um, photodyes, for example. And you can even separate them uh, from the heat related effects, which is very significant when you would like to investigate the semiconductors. And uh, here I would uh, like to show you uh, in more details how to perform this uh, photosensitive measurement. Uh, thanks to the uh, near infrared wavelengths, where you can use this uh, transmission uh, uh, holography, you can apply it to such sensitive samples as photosensitive polymer, which change their structure. They, are, uh, they solidify if they are imposed to a visible light of special spectrum. And um, uh, thanks to this non-destructive uh, nature of the procedure, you can uh, control indeed the destruction of the material with another wavelength and to monitor it in, in um, real time. For this, uh, you, you just apply a, uh, illumination of uh, the material at certain points uh, within your field of view uh, with a certain wavelengths and controlled amount of uh, intensity. And uh, this is how this looks in reality when you reconstruct your phase maps from the holograms. So, 
at the very beginning, you have um, um, nothing. And then uh, slightly as you monitor with time, you see that the phase map changes its color and it starts to grow up and grow up to become more bright. And uh, this is exactly that uh, the change of the refractive index is monitored and uh, it is tracked. And uh, you can even see such a moment when suddenly something happens and you don't have the same values of your face as a moment before. And this is an evidence of one of the common uh, phenomena which takes in this polymerization when you have too much uh, intensity directed to the sample which is already polymerized. And in order to, 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 to analyze what happens there, you calculate the maximum change of um, the phase and of the refractive index, which you can recalculate from the layer thickness of your sample. And you monitor that it actually follows a very typical chemical um, reaction function, which is a sigmoid function. And um, since you can have a very low amount of intensity going to the sample, you can have in time all the steps what are followed both, uh, by this uh, chemical reaction monitor it and what is very important not only visually analyzed but also quantified in some usual um, usable numbers um, and the accuracy here stands uh, up to the fourth number after the comma when you talk about the refractive index um, about the refractive uh, about the free carriers mapping it is more or less very similar procedure. You still have this uh, near infrared um, uh, light that comes through the uh, semiconductor within its trans transparency band and uh, you don't have almost any influence. So of course, a little bit you have always, but still uh, you do not excitate um, any significant amounts of uh, carriers. But if you would apply a some um, higher energy illumination, for example, at the green light of 532 nanometers, you can controllably um, uh, induce their excess carriers. And the nature of semiconductors is so that uh, when there is a lot of excess carriers in the material, they change the absorption properties of the sample and also its refractive index. And with digital holography, you can see this change of the refractive index change because of the change of the phase pattern you measure. And this is how it looks. Uh, with phase, you get even better sensitivity. Uh, you can capture that uh, be, uh, within your spot of illumination, you get the highest number of phase change and thus refractive index change and thus free carriers in the middle, and they are gradually uh, slowing down uh, to the uh, edges of the illumination spot, where the absorption is a little bit more complicated difference uh, because of the uh, also sensitivity limit of your detection. This you can see here when you talk about the line scans. If you get the line scans of uh, over the phase maps uh, recorded uh, for different powers, you see that there is a linear dependency which you can use for qualitative analysis of how your carriers are injected there. Whereas for absorption, since absorption map is actually recalculated from the intensity information from the hologram, you still have this sensitivity level and noise level and only from certain, uh, some point of, um, uh, of information level, you get uh, the, the, the linear dependency of the power and absorption change. And um, to show uh, also, you can al always uh, see whether your measurement is in fact uh, somewhat uh, re uh, reasonable uh, due to the, um, uh, due to the uh, comparison of your experimental results from the theory. And uh, uh, although there are, uh, the processes in semiconductors do not allow them to numerically simulate as precise for many uh, phenomena as uh, uh, just uh, phenomena of diffraction, you can still compare at least the behavior of the curves for typical parameters of the material and also experimentally measured data, which are really close. And uh, um, you can use it for templar monitoring of the material. And with this, you can see that there is uh, a change between of the, uh, the refractive index that is induced by the excess carriers and the change of phase because of the heating of the material. Because when you heat the material, 
and you do that with uh, high intensely and highly uh, focused light, the material in, elongates a little bit and also expands a little bit. And with this, it also changes the refractive index. But the, uh, the holographic approach allows to separate these processes. And here you can see that in case of a material where you can't control that it is almost not uh, heated up, you have a constant level of this change of the refractive um, index as long as you have the excess carrier generation. Whereas where you have a sample where it is heated up instead, you see the uh, um, gradient of this change. And this can be uh, always uh, confirmed with another method with uh, uh, monitoring with the thermal camera where you can see that um, in one case where you know that your sample is not uh, heating up, uh, up almost at all, the change of the surface where you illuminate it with um, uh, ex um, um, uh, a triggering light, it is uh, just only several, uh, uh, um, just 0 0.1 degree for the time you are interested in. And uh, for another sample, it is almost 10 degrees in total. And uh, the very last application, if I have still some time, I would like to show you um, a little bit about um, another form of holography. So everything previously was in image plane when you have an image uh, overlapped with a reference weight, but you can also have the image with collimated beams, this Fourier holography. And this can be applied in order to analyze the devices, real devices that are used uh, in some fundamental research or somewhere else. These are diode lasers. The diode lasers are based on the wave guides uh, in the uh, semiconductor materials, and they have a very specific uh, mode structure of the laser uh, if you talk about the spatial profile. And if you are managing to um, uh, get your probing light inside and outside and to overlap that as collimated beams with reference, you can get actually at the output, the information on the intensity distribution at the end facet of the device. For that, you have to reconstruct the hologram, uh, reconstruct the phase and uh, to numerically focus it. And you can see how the mode, uh, this is an example of how the intensity profile as a facet of the diet is changing. It, it appears that there are several side lobes, although there is only fundamental mode. And then you can also analyze from some other parameters in uh, the research that uh, uh, these uh, diagrams are part of, we're interested to see what the absorption and gain of such laser is, so how efficient it, and it shows how the amplification within the material uh, is distributed over the waveguides uh, facets um, uh, with respect uh, to the intensity distribution. And uh, uh, you can always have some uh, comparison techniques. Uh, in this case, it was a comparison between the imaging methods, which was actually the first demonstration. So there, there are uh, so far no imaging possibilities to uh, analyze the absorption of the uh, semiconductor lasers, uh, which was compared with the spectral uh, technique qualitatively, which is a common use, uh, commonly used now. And you see that it has uh, the very similar behavior, although uh, there is still uh, what to do in order to uh, have the qualitative comparison. And um, with this, I would like to summarize my talk uh, since I have only several minutes left. So you can see you see that the digital holography is a very broad um, uh, technique which can be used for a very broad range of applications, and it can be really precise so that you can open new applications in material or device research. It can and uh, it can be very fast. It's still uh, uh, stays sim uh, simple, universal, and it can be always uh, also applied online. And uh, it can be uh, applied not only to simple samples, but also to complex waveguiding where you have some changes within the sample inside. With this, I would like to thank you for your attention. And if you have any questions, I'm very happy to ask uh, to answer them. Thank you, Vera. Maybe question? Yeah, may I ask a question? Yeah, sure. Yes, Victor. Okay, yeah. Thank you, Vera, for a very nice presentation. Uh, and uh, my question will be, what is the minimum resolution uh, for this holography representation? Because mm -hmm. it meets certain requirements. 
yeah. I believe that those um, uh, bulk heterojunction or like mixture of organic semiconductors I'm going to talk just after you uh, could be a very good system for to study with your techniques since mm -hmm. there you have both complex three-dimensional morphology and photogeneration of acceptance and free charge carriers. So it's like combination of some complex uh, three-dimensional morphology with semiconductor properties. Uh, yeah, so, so uh, uh, thank you very much for this question. So uh, there are two parts uh, of answering uh, it. Uh, the first part uh, is purely about the experimental setup and instruments that can be, uh, in fact, uh, constructed. And here I have a backup slide on some uh, numbers. Uh, so this system has been um, used with several sources. Uh, super luminescent diet, uh, super luminescent diet with some spectral and special um, um, filters and a diet laser of uh, more or less uh, broad, uh, more or less narrow uh, spectral range. And um, what you can get uh, from um, uh, from from this. Uh, um, yeah, uh, sorry. So here, uh, and what you can get uh, from the sources, uh, uh, this is the resolution. Uh, so with the uh, SLD, uh, you can get uh, approximately 500 something nanometers, whereas with infrared laser, you can get 600 and 700 uh, depend. Uh, so yes, of course, if you would, uh, it also depends on what objective you use. This is uh, just uh, answer on the resolution of what the uh, instrument can allow. Um, from the holographic point of view, it's really depends uh, only on two points on the uh, pixel uh, resolutions that you have on your camera and the objects you can uh, plug into your system. But what um, uh, con concerning uh, the second part of my answer uh, um, with the resolution for wave guiding structures analysis, it's not that straightforward to answer uh, for the reason that uh, it depends on how you um, collimate your light after you uh, gather the light from the waveguide. And another thing is um, uh, how your virtual lens is working and what exactly is the size. Um, so I mean, what size of, um, of your camera you can cover with a collimated beam. And this is um, a point that of course has not such nice resolution, but maybe you would have uh, something like uh, closer to the numbers of this 10 times objective of uh, uh, one micrometer, something like that. Okay, okay, thank you. Yeah, I guess in general, this state of the art lens, we have smaller features like tens of uh, nanometers. Uh, but yeah, I think you could maybe think about this in future. Um, for a smaller uh, for smaller features, it, it would be uh, most probably better to not to use it in transmission, but maybe in reflection, because then you can apply a much uh, uh, better performance of objectives, and you are not limited to um, experimental um, mm -hmm. design. So, if you are interested, I can. Um, I'll show you how this actually looks in reality. Uh, so. Um, you have just, uh, in case of a waveguide, you have a very small lens with very small clear aperture, which definitely uh, limits your uh, resolution, but this can be changed. And, uh, uh, but if you use it in reflection, you can have a microscopic objective with 10 times resolution, and then you can come to uh, hundreds of nanometers. And also you can come to a, a smaller wavelengths. So mm -hmm. all the that are shown for near infrared. If you are not in the transmission and can change to reflection, you can come to uh, some blue uh, laser with uh, 400 something, and then everything just uh, can be factored by two. Sure, that sounds interesting. Mm -hmm. It definitely could be could be done. And plus, these films are very narrow, so like they are very thin, so it would be possible even in transmission mode to go for. Uh, um, shorter wavelengths because it's very thin, like 100 nanometers plus minus. Yeah, the samples uh, that uh, uh, I have shown here for the, um, um, for the semiconductors, uh, the thickness, uh, so the length of this diet was four micrometers. Mm -hmm. So it's already quite much. And when it yeah. was uh, several uh, just slices of uh, 
uh, semiconductor, it was uh, 600. Mm -hmm. So um, it's not that many if you have just several, um, oh, I'm sorry, four millimeters. I thought of, uh, I said four micrometers. So the diet here, you can, you can really see it. It's four millimeters. Mm -hmm. it's really long. And here it's not, it makes no sense. Um, but here it was possible because of the absorption and uh, um, uh, gain properties of the material, you could reach uh, the transmission here. If you go to just silicon or gallium arsenide, it might be difficult. Sure. Mm -hmm. yeah. okay, okay, thank you. you. Okay. Uh, questions? No. Uh, and next, our speaker, Victor Bruce from Kazakhstan, and uh, the title of the presentation, Novel Organic Photics and Optoelectronics. Please, Victor. Okay, thank you very much for the introduction. Uh, can I share my screen? Okay, do you see my screen? <clears throat> yes. Cool. So, <clears throat> uh, today I will... Uh, combine some optics and electronic processes. So we will end up with optoelectronics and photovoltaics. Uh, my talk will consist of two uh, main uh, parts. It's understanding generation and recombination processes in <clears throat> organic solar cells, and also uh, some novel near infrared organic photodiodes. So first, motivation. I think that um, quite straightforward motivation because after experiencing globally uh, so many extreme uh, climate conditions like uh, flooding in Western Europe and China, uh, wildfires in Siberia and California, uh, extreme heat wave in the, uh, British Columbia, and extreme low temperatures in uh, Texas, um, and this year still not ended. So we understand that uh, this uh, um, uh, conventional energy system, which works mostly just only injecting CO2 in our atmosphere, is not a sustainable solution. We need to proceed further with some uh, <clears throat> renewable energies and solar um, or photovoltaics is uh, one of the dominant uh, players in this field. So Oops. There are three commonly used um, types of solar cells. Mostly they are um, varied by the materials they are based on. Um, we have inorganic uh, solar cells, mostly based on uh, silicon. It's quite conventional and established technology. Uh, organic uh, solar cells based on uh, plastic um, organic semiconductors and hybrid uh, perovskites, which are hybrid organic and organic materials um, and can combine features of, of both, um, which also quite interesting and uh, perspective. Um, obviously, like all of these three types of solar cells, they are good. They do their work and convert sunlight into electricity. Um, however, mm, obviously every type has some advantages and disadvantages. And uh, um, today I'm going to talk like, this is my main field of research, organic um, solar cells and photodiodes. Uh, so let's start with the first uh, part of my talk, generation recombination processes in organic solar cells. And what impressions do you have when you hear plastic? So usually it's some isolation materials, uh, in um, electrical wires, we use plastic isolation uh, or some packaging. Uh, however, um, it's not so commonly to consider plastic as a semiconductor. But depends on the chemical structure. It was shown in 70s that uh, with, for instance, polyacetylene, um, there are these so-called conjugated polymers with uh, alternating double bonds where one electron is weakly bound and uh, can be delocalized all over the lens of this uh, conjugated backbone. So with this delocalization, 
means there is some free charge carriers which can move if we place such material in external electric field and conduct electricity. For this uh, invention, three authors of this um, paper where it was firstly uh, introduced uh, got Nobel Prize in Chemistry in 2000. And uh, with one of them, which is Alan Higer, uh, who established Center for Polymers and Organic Solids. I had a chance to overlap at the University of California, Santa Barbara. Uh, and that was, of course, very exciting uh, experience to work with the uh, literally father of organic electronics. Uh, <clears throat> benefits of organic semiconductors in comparison to um, organic, uh, sorry, uh, uh, benefits of organic semiconductors in comparison to inorganic, um, they are, they can be flexible, but uh, also uh, what is very important, it is possible to um, change the conductivity of these organic semiconductors by many orders of magnitude as similar to inorganic semiconductors by adding some uh, molecules. Uh, so, uh, well, uh, during our study of some new type of doping of organic semiconductors, we uh, managed to change their conductivity in a uh, very broad range of magnitudes and uh, like within about five orders of magnitude by adding uh, some special molecule to this uh, polymer. And uh, <clears throat> these results were highlighted in our recent paper, Advanced in uh, Nature Materials, uh, published uh, in 2019. Um, so commonly, um, organic semiconductors have already found their application as OLEDs and uh, OFETs, uh, organic light emitting diodes and uh, organic field effect transistors. Um, so it's commercially available, uh, big market of um, displays. Uh, but uh, organic photovoltaics is now as an emerging um, field. And um, we believe that in the nearest future, it will uh, make a big contribution in this field of uh, wide applications. So let us talk more about these organic uh, solar cells and understand their device structure and uh, principles of uh, operation. So here is uh, some schematic representation of an organic solar cell. We have glass substrate, um, ice transparent conductive layer ITO, uh, indium tin oxide. Then we have um, electron uh, transport layer. Uh, which is uh, zinc oxide thin film uh, deposited by spin coating. Then on top, we have so-called ball heterojunction layer, a mixture of donor and acceptor organic semiconductors. We will talk about this in more details later. And uh, on top of this, we have molybdenum oxide and uh, silver. So molybdenum oxide serves here as uh, whole transport layer and silver as electrode which collects the charge carriers. So um, usually we consider that this bulk heterojunction layer, a mixture of two donor acceptors, uh, consists of intrinsic semiconductors, means not dope. And uh, because of the difference in work functions of anode and cathode, like this electron transport and whole transport layers, um, when we put them in contact and they go to thermal equilibrium, we have a uh, single Fermi level for whole system. And that causes, um, it creates internal electric field, which is uniform along the uh, active layer and causes this linear band bending um, of uh, HOMO and LUMO levels for donor and accept. HOMO and LUMO levels stands for uh, highest occupied molecule or orbitals and uh, LUMO for lowest unoccupied molecule orbitals. So in comparison to inorganic semiconductors, we have mm, LUMO stands for uh, conduction band, HOMO stands for balance band, and the gap between them uh, stands for the uh, band gap. So once we create 
pre-charge carrier, and we will talk again in details how we form this charge carrier under illumination. Um, they are separated with strong electric field in the active layer and are collected by respective electrodes. So cathode uh, electrons are connect, uh, collected by cathode and uh, holes are collected by the anode. Uh, so here is a representation of our equivalent circuit uh, of a solar cell. Uh, so we have some photo current generator in the active layer, also some diode, because in the dark, you see GV curve, uh, current voltage characteristic of a solar cell in the dark looks like a diode current voltage characteristic. We have very small reverse current and then uh, rapidly exponentially increasing forward current. So it's classical diode characteristic. Um, also, we have some shunt resistance, means we have some physical shunts of the active layer um, and also some recombination losses. So this uh, is kind of, we, we prefer not to have this, should be infinity. However, um, that's what it is in real life. So we need to take this into account. And also some series resistance, which should also be taken into account, some voltage drop over this series resistance when electric current is uh, flowing uh, through this circuit. So there are uh, three main photoelectric parameters. Um, when we measure uh, light GV characteristics, current voltage characteristic, um, at zero volts, we have short circuit current. So when cathode and anode just short it. Um, so this is maximum current, which, will, uh, which we can measure uh, in the external circuit without applying any reverse bias. Uh, also, there is uh, open circuit voltage, and that is parameter which we measure between this, some voltage uh, potential difference between cathode and anode when we have open circuit. Um, that is defined by the properties of the uh, active layer, means effective band gap, and also uh, on recombination losses. Since we don't have any extraction uh, on open circuit uh, voltage, so everything what is generated, everything recombines, we have steady state condition, quasi Fermi levels are splitting and they are um, parallel along all device. Um, and uh, that under these conditions, uh, we will, uh, recombination dynamics will define uh, what uh, VOC uh, we will measure. And also there is this maximum power point, it's maximum power which can be um, generated by a solar cell, uh, which uh, there is such parameter as fill factor. We get this maximum uh, output power, maximum current and maximum voltage, divided by product of short circuit current and open circuit voltage. So PCE, which is photoconversion efficiency, is defined as the product of three main photoelectric parameters, short circuit voltage, open circuit, uh, sorry, short circuit current, open circuit voltage and field factor, um, divided by the input power of sunlight, which hits the solar cell. So, uh, now let us talk a bit about the uh, change of performance of organic solar cells. We can see that uh, first organic solar cells were produced uh, in early 2000. They were steadily uh, increasing in performance and most of these devices used um, cooler and based uh, acceptor materials. So we have donor and acceptor. We will discuss this uh, a bit more in details, but acceptor material was kind of limited to this fuller and base derivatives, uh, which were soluble in chloroform or fluorobenzene. Uh, recently, starting somewhere from 2016, um, this uh, big contribution in the field of development non fuller and acceptors has been made. And we can see really rapid increase in uh, performance in recent years. Um, now it's even reaching higher. Recently, like one week ago, it was a publication reporting 18% uh, for single uh, junction organic, uh, sorry, 19% for a single junction organic photovoltaic device. 
And uh, uh, the main reason for such steep increase uh, is the possibility to modify, like unlimited possibilities to modify chemical structure of non pullen acceptors um, in terms of uh, side chains, uh, backbone, um, and atoms, uh, heteroatoms, and uh, so on. Um, that provides uh, flexible approaches to modify uh, properties of these uh, materials and feed requirements for high performance. So we can see here an example. Um, for instance, uh, in our recent uh, work, we used one donor polymer donor material and three different um, non fullen acceptors. So you can see here that the difference between these um, non fullen acceptors is only in side chains. Uh, so here we have symmetric side chains. Here we leave one side chain and change it to another, like second one. And here we again uh, have symmetric but different side chains. So uh, actually not such a big difference between all these three molecules, but you can see what a dramatic change in the absorption spectrum it results in. So we actually um, can consistently uh, reduce the band gap and uh, by changing these side chains, uh, meaning that we can shift our absorption uh, range towards um, like beyond the photosensitivity region of uh, classical uh, optoelectronic material, which is silicon. It usually absorbs up to um, 1100 nanometers. So we can already do even better. <laughs> uh, so now let us talk about uh, physics of um, principles. Uh, of functioning of these devices. Uh, in order to make organic solar cell work, we need to have a bulk heterogeneous here. Sorry about this. Uh, active bulk heterojunction layer, uh, a mixture of uh, donor and acceptor. So why we cannot deal with one layer, um, one donor or one acceptor? Um, the problem is that uh, organic semiconductor possess very low dielectric constant, uh, and uh, the electrostatic interaction between photo excited electron and holes is quite strong. So there is large binding energy uh, in the exciton, which has to be somehow uh, overcome uh, in order to separate these charge carriers and make them possible to be used in photocarbon. So the thing is that um, it is possible to split these electron uh, excitons at the interface between donor and acceptor. In that case, if we have some quantum discontinuity of energy levels, some so-called LUMO-LUMO and HOMO-HOMO offsets. And uh, in that case, um, this could do work for us in terms of splitting the uh, excitons, uh, of course, we will pay for this because uh, effective band gap will be reduced. Uh, so we don't want to have too big uh, gaps here. Uh, it will be efficient uh, exciton splitting uh, interface, but we will lose too much and our uh, VOC, one of the main photoelectric parameters will be quite limited. So we want just, just enough to split excitons, but not uh, more than necessary. And uh, <clears throat> once we generate um, exciton in such a nanostructured uh, mixture of donors and acceptors, um, it has to have a chance to diffuse to the interface between donor and acceptor. And this will happen only if uh, the distance from the generation point to the interface will be not more than 10 nanometers. Uh, plus minus a few nanometers, uh, but in the range of 10 nanometers, because this is the diffusion length of excitons. If this interface will be further from the point where this exciton is generated, then uh, it will be a problem because exciton will annihilate before reaching the interface and it will not contribute to uh, photocarbon. So from other side, we cannot make this 
three-dimensional morphology of donor and acceptor in the active layer um, too small because uh, we will split all photogenerity charge carriers, but at some point they need also to reach the cathode and anode, and they need this uh, network from through which they will move in the active layer on their way to extraction. Um, so that's why there should be a compromise. Uh, keep in mind that all these uh, morphologies of bulk heterojunctions, they are self-organized. We mix two uh, semiconductors together in the solvent. We sometimes add some solvents, solvent additives. Uh, also, we can apply some uh, annealing uh, post-deposition in order to manipulate this morphology. But uh, pretty much it is defined by uh, self-organization. And uh, uh, some systems, the like combination of donor acceptors work better, some worse. And it's very important for us to uh, learn more about this three-dimensional uh, morphology in the active layer, because that will definitely have a direct impact on the performance of our device. So let us assume that we, uh, this, this photogenerated exciton did it and uh, reached the interface. So here we can have two options. It still can recombine. Um, it's within such so-called charge transfer state at the interface between donor and acceptor layer. Uh, or it can be split in three charge carriers. So this uh, recombination of uh, exciton at the interface is called geminate recombination. Geminate recombination because um, here we have geminate recombination, electrons and holes from which originate from the same photo excitation act uh, will uh, recombine. So once they are separated, and that's what we want, uh, problems still not ended because uh, we need to extract these charge carriers from the uh, volume of the organic semiconductor or active layer of this bulk heterojunction layer. Um, on the way of extracting these charge carriers, so holes are moving in the donor uh, network, uh, electrons are moving in the acceptor um, network, uh, they may meet at the interface with some other electrons and holes uh, originated from other photo excitation uh, events. And that uh, will cause some recombination and loss of these charge carriers. Uh, this type of recombination is called non-geminate recombination and then can be split in two major types. First is bimolecular, when we have band-to-band -band recombination, that's unavoidable recombination, because if we can create charge carriers by absorbing light, it should be possible uh, to go in reverse, um, recombine charge carriers and emit light. Uh, so it's kind of uh, radiative uh, bimolecular recombination. Uh, but also there is trap-assisted recombination. So when we have some... Uh, defects or some impurities in the active layer, uh, those can act as uh, traps of charge carriers. And uh, according to shockley reed hall statistic, they can contribute in uh, trap-assisted recombination, which is also like one of subtype type of uh, non-geminate recombination. Okay, so now ideal JV characteristic or current voltage characteristic would look something like this. We should have large short circuit current, large POC, and large field pack. However, when we have this geminate recombination contribution, when excitons um, recombine before they can be split in free charge carriers, um, then uh, uh, we lose already uh, quite a lot of short circuit current because we have less charge carriers to extract we created last free charge carriers. And also we lose some VOC because total balance uh, of uh, generation recombination is already uh, lower. So we le generate less charge carriers and there will be less splitting of quasi Fermi levels. On top, if we add some sh uh, shock lead hole recombination that reduces all photoelectric parameters, um, short circuit current, field factor, VOC. So, Obviously, we don't want to have these processes 
And in order to have a chance to avoid them as possible, as, as, as much as possible, we need to uh, understand uh, in details their physics um, and how they, um, what parameters are governing them and what can be done in order to eliminate these processes uh, to that extent which is possible. So uh, our common approach to um, uh, understand these processes starts from uh, optical simulation. Uh, it's not so advanced as uh, previous um, in, discussed in previous lectures. However, that works quite well for us. So we use transfer matrix optical modeling. Um, we want to simulate uh, interference pattern of uh, different wavelengths in the active layer, considering full stack of the device and op with given optical constants n and k uh, as a function of wavelength for all layers which are involved in our device stack. So once we know these interference patterns of uh, light intensity within the active layer for every wavelength, we can um, get such a two dimensional uh, generation rate distribution when we have uh, dependence of our generation rate uh, within the thickness of the active layer and also uh, in the within the spectral range of photosensitivity. So this tells us the total amount of uh, excitons uh, photo generated inside our um, active layer. And uh, next step, obviously we need to address this geometry combination because we remember not every photogenerated exciton can contribute to photocurrent and uh, that should be taken into account in organic solar cells. So this um, geometry recombination can be addressed in um, most commonly two different ways, um, either with steady state approach, which uh, uh, we proposed recently, we combine this uh, simulated generation rate in the active layer uh, and calculate theoretical short circuit current, which would be the maximum short, cur short circuit current theoretically possible, assuming that we don't lose any excitons and all of them contribute to short circuit current. And also we have some uh, experimentally measured on the monochromatic, different monochromatic illumination, um, JV curves, uh, then subtract uh, dark JV curve from light JV curve, get photo current. And uh, then we measure photo current at large reverse bias. So at this large reverse bias, we um, create very strong internal electric field, which efficiently separates charge carriers uh, inside the active layer. And that uh, prevents possibility for non geometry combination means that this uh, photo generated um, saturated photo current um, is equal to the total generation rate of excitons times some uh, coefficient PG, which is uh, geminid recombination prefactor. And the ratio between um, this measured theoretical photo current and, sorry, the, between this saturated photo current and this theoretical short circuit current will give us this um, uh, uh, geminid recombination prefect. So another approach which is more advanced uh, and uh, requires use of very uh, fast uh, laser pulses um, and uh, first electronics in order to switch and apply um, reverse bias uh, is based on the following concept. So we have some uh, very short laser pulse, which generates certain charge carriers in the um, active layer. So we know how, we know intensity and we know duration of this pulse. So we know how many photons, because it's monochromatic light, how many photons um, were like pumped into the active layer. Uh, then we uh, apply very rapidly uh, large reverse bias, which uh, prevents uh, from the uh, geminate recombination and extract charge carriers. So we measure current 
and there will be some uh, pulses of this photocurrent, which we can measure. And uh, uh, we can compare number of extracted charge carriers to number of uh, incident photons. That will also give us the uh, geminate prefactor. So once the generation of excitons and geminate recombination is known, uh, we need to proceed further with the next step, uh, analyzing the scope of multi-mechanism recombination model, non-geminate recombination. And non-geminate recombination, in general case, when we have multi-mechanism recombination model, uh, it consists of uh, three components. There is some um, bimolecular recombination, when we have band-to-band -band recombination. Uh, then we have uh, trap-assisted recombination in the bulk, we have some defects in the bulk of the active layer. And also we have some um, recombination as the interface between active layer and electrodes. So with this different mechanism of recombination, uh, they form total recombination losses. And we can experimentally measure recombination current uh, in our device. And then um, by applying some technique for of voltage impedance spectroscopy, we can calculate this N, which goes into all equations. Uh, N is concentration of uh, charge carriers at different bias. Uh, so once we know concentration of charge carriers in uh, a different bias in our active layer, we can um, substitute it here in this equation and determine unknown parameters as fitting parameters. So here they are, this is pre-geminate um, recombination coefficient, uh, concentration of bulk traps, and concentration of surface traps. So bulk per cubic centimeter and surface per square centimeter. Once we get the best fit for um, this experimentally measured uh, recombination current, we can um, get this quantity of um, information about recombination related parameters. Uh, what is nice, once we know uh, all recombination-related parameters, we can simulate um, contribution of each mechanism at different biases, because we know uh, N at different biases, concentration of charge carriers, so we can uh, calculate um, separately contribution from bimolecular, uh, trap-assisted in the bulk, and trap-assisted at the interface. What is interesting, for instance, here, uh, we see that uh, surface recombination uh, is dominant at large forward bias, which is close to open circuit voltage. So it will have a negative effect on um, exclusively on uh, surface, um, uh, on the open circuit voltage. Um, and uh, at short circuit current uh, or at some reverse bias for photodiodes, for instance, uh, it will not play much of the role, and this will be defined by the ratio between bimolecular and um, trap-assisted recombination in the uh, bulk of the active layer. So um, why it's important? Because instead of considering solar cell in this simple equivalent circuit, which we um, introduced at the early beginning, uh, we can do a little bit better. We can... Um, deconvolute different mechanisms of recombination losses, quantify them, and um, analyze on a higher, more advanced level the optoelectronic processes which are uh, happening in organic solar cells under different conditions, uh, different biases, different uh, temperatures, different light intensities. Um, and that uh, will tell us more in terms of understanding device physics and possibilities for their improvement. So with this, I want to uh, proceed further to another um, topic which I would like to cover in my talk. It is uh, near-infrared organic photodiodes. So uh, application of photodetectors is quite uh, broad and we definitely need them for imaging, for spectrometers, for some uh, robotic applications, also for medical monitoring. Uh, <clears throat> Organic semiconductors provide some additional functionalities which can be uh, successfully implemented in the field of 
um, photo detectors. So uh, what is the most interesting is flexibility, um, even stretchability of uh, organic uh, photo detectors. Uh, and uh, that is uh, biocompatibility with uh, the skin in terms of mechanical properties. Uh, also, uh, in addition, um, these organic semiconductors are not toxic, uh, so they uh, they should be uh, quite biocompatible with uh, our organism. So uh, they find more and more applications in uh, medical monitoring. Uh, there are most commonly three uh, different types of photo detectors. It's photoresistor when we have just two metal contacts and a uh, resistive semiconductor in between. So we shine light, create some charge carriers that reduces resistance of this um, bulk or thin film uh, semiconductor, and we can detect this. So this is probably the simplest uh, example. Uh, photodiode when we have uh, active layer hole and electron uh, transport layers and uh, uh, anode and cathode, uh, which is very similar to um, the structure of uh, solar cells, organic solar cells. Also the uh, uh, phototransistor where we can uh, form the drain source and uh, uh, gate electrodes. So with gate electrode, we can modulate conductivity of the active layer and uh, measure uh, current between source and drain, which will be a function of some illumination. So here we uh, will talk more about these photodiodes, organic photodiodes. And uh, uh, I would like to present you this system, which is a mixture of um, PTBC, PTB7TH uh, donor and CO1 uh, for HL, uh, CL um, acceptor material. So it's narrow band gap uh, acceptor material, which allows us to absorb up to 1200 uh, nanometers. And that is very important because there is a request in um, industry for uh, organic flexible uh, photodiodes, which are uh, capable of working at uh, wavelengths uh, about 1,000 nanometers or even beyond. So here are some characteristics of this uh, photodiode. So we made two photodiodes with different uh, thicknesses of active layers, 90 and 300 nanometers. And uh, um, we can see that uh, 300 nanometer, the photodiode with thicker active layer behaves in terms of reverse current, and that's very important characteristic for photodiodes because we want to have it as small as possible uh, because it will define uh, electrical noise. So we see that it is um, definitely a smaller current at reverse bias uh, <clears throat> for uh, thicker active layer, and if we compare electrical noise measured as a function of frequency, we can see that a thick device indeed shows lower noise levels for uh, electrical uh, noise, noise current. Uh, another important uh, characteristic which comes out from this noise current uh, is specific, specific detectivity, which shows uh, what is the minimum signal, uh, useful signal, and photodiode detect um, in comparison to the background noise. So we can see here this brown, like uh, gray uh, dashed line. Uh, it is a representation of a silicon photodiode. And uh, this is one, our device with a thickness of 300 nanometers. So it actually performs pretty much the same uh, in very broad spectral range. And this is quite a good result for um, 300 nanometer uh, thick plastic uh, active layer, which can be uh, by definition flexible or even stretchable. Uh, also another characteristic which is important for photodiodes is fast response. It's how fast they can um, switch with uh, changing uh, external uh, light signal. 
So you can see that for 20 kilohertz signal, it can reproduce signal completely. Um, however, it deteriorates this um, shape of the uh, response of the uh, photo detector deteriorates uh, with uh, uh, increasing frequency. And there is some limit which over which we cannot go. However, um, the uh, fast response of these devices is good enough to monitor, uh, for instance, uh, blood uh, pulse uh, and uh, like heart pulse. And uh, because of uh, increasing and decreasing volume of uh, blood vessels, um, there is different absorption of infrared light in the human tissue. And that can be monitored by this organic photo detector and uh, represent uh, in terms of photo uh, current as a reproducible uh, signal. Uh, so I would like to finish my presentation with summarizing some different um, devices I have been working during recent years and uh, um, was actually while well, preparing this presentation, uh, kind of uh, interestingly, interestingly uh, surprised that it, some of them uh, cover quite a broad spectral range, starting from um, gamma rays, X-rays uh, detectors based on graphene and cadmium telluride, some solar cells and uh, uh, photo detectors cover visible, ultraviolet, visible and infrared, near infrared, uh, some thermoelectric um, devices uh, which uh, work in the infrared and uh, uh, ionic organic electronic ratchets which are uh, working in the uh, microwaves and radio waves uh, spectral ranges. So obviously such a broad and um, mm, field of research interest possible in collaboration with um, very uh, talented and uh, motivated scientists all over the world. So I would like to acknowledge a uh, contribution from my previous um, colleagues at SIPOS uh, Center, uh, at Helmholtz Center in Berlin, collaborators from all over the world, and also uh, funding agencies who supported my research uh, in this field. So with this, thank you very much for attention and hope to answer your questions. Thank you. Question? Okay, without questions. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you for our speakers for this, this interesting uh, presentation. And, uh, Vera, Vera. Um, it was not the question, everything was clear. I just wanted to thank oh, okay. the speaker for the very nice uh, and detailed talk. Okay. Thanks. Thank you very much. Thank you one more time. Bye. Yeah, bye-bye. <laughs>